Thank you for joining us on this absolutely beautiful Friday evening. Good evening. I'm Regina Mobley and I'm Janet Roach all day. We've been seeing mostly mm -hmm. sunny skies, breezy conditions and temperatures in the mid 70s. Our cameras caught people soaking up the sun near The Hague in Norfolk. And here's a live look at the boats in Hampton at the marina from our Chamberlain camera. Evan, we should enjoy this while we can. Changes are a coming. Yes, yeah, some big changes for the weekend. We're talking about the possibility of a wintry mix in here tomorrow afternoon, tomorrow evening. You wouldn't imagine it when you look outside right now. Lots of blue skies out along the ocean front and temperatures in the 70s in most locations. This is almost an identical setup to what we saw on the same date back in 2007 when we had a very warm day. Heavy rain moving in the following morning and then that cold air working its way in behind it. And that's what we could see tomorrow as well. First, if you're heading out this evening again, looking very nice, we'll see the clouds on the increase. Temperatures by midnight only around 60 degrees. And again, you're thinking, how can we get any kind of wintry weather with that? Well, we've got sort of a double barrel system that's working its way in. Already starting to see a few of the showers in advance of it working through central North Carolina. But it's really this part of the system back here across uh, Louisiana and Alabama, Mississippi and the cold front through here. The two of them are going to come in together as we go through the day tomorrow, causing temperatures to drop 6 a.m. 56 degrees. But notice as we go through the day, temperatures falling. Good chance at some rain, maybe a little bit of a break around midday, but a soaking rain starting to change over and mix with a little bit of sleet or some wet snow as we get into the evening. Now, when I come back, we'll time it out a little bit more with Futurecast, let you know what I'm thinking as far as any potential accumulations and the rest of the 7-day forecast in just a few minutes. All right, thanks, Evan. A man is fighting for his life tonight after a motorcycle crash in Norfolk. Just before 11 this morning, police were called to a car crash involving a motorcycle. That was on North Newtown Road. Paramedic found the man lying in the street. He was taken to the hospital. We are told he has life-threatening injuries. No charges are being filed right now, but police are still investigating. A July trial date has been set for a Portsmouth woman charged in the death of a newborn child. A grand jury indicted Danita Hawkins yesterday on second degree murder. Her trial is set to start July 11th in Portsmouth. Hawkins was initially charged in 2017 after she was taken to the hospital along with the dead newborn baby boy in a plastic bag. After an investigation, the death was ruled a homicide. An Army soldier based at Fort Eustace is facing serious charges, including abduction. Newport News police say James Jackson Jr. got into an argument with his girlfriend while driving on I-664. This happened last night. Police say Jackson pulled over onto the shoulder and told the woman to get out of the car. When she refused, Jackson allegedly pointed a gun at her head and told her to get in the truck. Instead, the woman got back into the seat and Jackson dropped her off at a 7-Eleven in Hampton. Jackson was brought to the Fort Eustis police station. He also faces gun charges. Governor Ralph Northam wants to know what state officials are doing to address rising suicide rates in the Commonwealth. He just signed a bill requiring the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services to issue a yearly report outlining its suicide prevention measures. That report will be reviewed by the governor and the General Assembly. Virginia's chief medical examiner says suicide rates among children in Virginia have risen 29 percent since 2016. A great new space is providing <coughs> opportunities for small business owners, aspiring business owners and entrepreneurs in Gloucester. 13 News Now reporter Nico Clemens shows us this is a small step in a larger effort to grow the local business economy. The more people we can serve, the better. It's sort of a new idea in Gloucester. Co-working. This is just an opportunity to work on your thing, but to do it together. Co-work Gloucester VA is a place for entrepreneurs, startups, and small business owners who need a space to work. Our heart is to provide a space that was like being at home, but with none of the distractions. Kevin Haggerty and Courtney Riley are co-owners, both entrepreneurs in Gloucester who are passionate about helping grow small business in the area. Anywhere from stopping in for an hour and working on your spreadsheet or your budgeting or whatever, to all the way up to having your own private office. I caught up with Haggerty and Riley during their free co-working day event. They wanted to open up their space to the community to come and try it out. Not only are we providing the space and that sense of community, but we're empowering and educating entrepreneurs to grow their businesses. Haggerty says right now they have eight different businesses represented at their space. They expect that number to grow. We're already at a point where we're having to ask ourselves, 
is this space big enough or are we going to have to expand? So the response has been overwhelming and we do absolutely see this as a need for Gloucester. Haggerty and Riley say this is just the beginning in Gloucester. Every day that we get to come in and see business owners being impacted by having this space in this community is rewarding. Later at 6, I'll introduce you to two friends who started a business about a year ago and are now taking advantage of the space at Cowork Gloucester VA. In Gloucester, Nico Clemens, 13 News Now. After months of planning, the city of Norfolk now has a bike sharing program. Norfolk is the first city in the Commonwealth to partner with PACE. There are 200 bikes and 20 docking stations around the city. Here's how it works. You have to download the PACE app and be 18 or older. Then you unlock the bikes using Bluetooth. The first ride is free. After that, it costs $1 every 30 minutes. So we definitely recommend that riders, particularly inexperienced riders or folks who are just getting used to using bikes again, get helmets. And when you're ready to lock up the bike, organizers ask that you put it in a docking station or any other bike rack. Pace plans to bring adaptive bikes to the area in the future. Now, the bike sharing program means we will see more cyclists on the road. Remember, the DMV says bicycles are considered vehicles when they are on the road. Cyclists must obey all traffic signs and signals. They are supposed to ride on the right side of the road with traffic and use hand signals for stops and turns. If you are riding on a sidewalk, you must give the right of way to pedestrians and call out to them if you pass them. Saying goodbye to a Navy legend, a Medal of Honor recipient was laid to rest this week at Arlington National Cemetery. Retired Navy Captain Thomas J. Hudner Jr. was buried with full military honors. 13 News Now reporter Mike Gooding has details on his amazing life. Well, and Janet, Captain Hudner was the last living Navy recipient of the Medal of Honor from the Korean War. He was, in fact, one of just 72 living Medal of Honor recipients, and with his passing, there are now just 71. Family and friends of Captain Thomas J. Hudner Jr. gathered at Arlington National Cemetery to salute the naval aviation legend. Full military honors were rendered by the U.S. Navy Ceremonial Guard. The ceremony also included a missing man formation flyover by Oceana Strike Fighter Squadron VFA-32, the same squadron Hudner was assigned to when he earned the Medal of Honor. Hudner received the medal from President Harry S. Truman for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty. It was during the Battle of Chosun River in the Korean War. During a mission, one of his fellow pilots, the Navy's first African-American naval aviator to fly in combat, Ensign Jesse L. Brown, was hit by anti-aircraft fire, damaging a fuel line and causing him to crash. Hudner purposefully crashed his own aircraft to join Brown and provide aid. Although the effort to save Brown was not successful, Hudner was recognized for the heroic attempt. After receiving recognition for his heroism, Hudner remained on active duty, completing an additional 22 years of naval service. A new ship, the 66th Arleigh Burke class guided missile destroyer USS Hudner, will be commissioned in Boston later this year. And just to give you an idea of how big of a deal this was, in attendance for Captain Hudner's interment was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Joseph Dunford, and the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral John Richardson. Reporting live, Mike Gooding, 13 News Now. A Coast Guard tall ship is in Norfolk for the weekend, and you can tour it. The Cutter Eagle is docked at the Nauticus Pier. Tours run until 7 o'clock tonight. They start again tomorrow at 10 and go until 7 p.m. The 295-foot vessel was commissioned by the German Navy in 1936. It was taken by the U.S. after World War II. Since 1946, it's been used to train Coast Guard cadets. If you're sailing for Ocracoke this year, get ready to do so under the black flag of the dreaded pirate Blackbeard. North Carolina Ferries will fly the flag to observe the 300th anniversary of Blackbeard's death in 1718. The flag will fly on ferries serving the Hatteras Ocracoke Cedar Island, Ocracoke and Swan Quarter Ocracoke routes. Also, the Pamlico River route between Bayview and Aurora. Both areas have historic ties to the 18th century 
complete scallywag. The city of Portsmouth is looking to the future. In a state of the city address today, Mayor John Rowe focused on economic development. 13 News Now reporter Jacqueline Lee is live in Portsmouth. And Jacqueline, what's in store for Portsmouth? Regina, Mayor Rowe focused on small businesses and their successes, and he said a priority moving forward is economic development. Part of that includes recognizing one of the city's greatest assets, and that is the waterfront. So he said what he and the city wants to do is take waterfront government properties and turn them over to private developers. You can't, you can't put a residential building where you've got an old jail. You can't put a residential building where you got City Hall. So the idea is to move off the waterfront and turn that property over to the private sector for development. And I asked Mayor Rowe what some of the greatest challenges the city of Portsmouth faces moving forward. He said it's recycling the land. So what exactly does that mean and what is he going to do to address it? I'll tell you up coming up on 13 News Now at 6. Live in Portsmouth, Jacqueline Lee. 13 News Now.